Good morning, everyone. I'm Meredith Dancos. I'm the lead pastor here. And uh, I'm going to do, I did this in the first hour, so I'm going to do this in the second hour so you don't miss out. Our first hour worship set was kind of rough. Like we had feedback and on our set was just, our, our team was working real hard to get it all settled. And I want you to know that this morning, every single fail safe that could fail, failed. Like we had everything that could go wrong, went wrong. And this team both everyone back there in the booth and everyone up here on the stage, they're all volunteers, and they shuffled and adapted and changed, and they, they made it happen. And, you know, so if you see them today, you can thank them. But I want to tell you that they're not the only ones. I mean, anyone that you ever see with a volunteer shirt, I know that back in our kids' hallway, most weeks, teachers are covering for each other, you know, moving different classrooms, helping each other out, our welcome team, same thing. And the truth is, our volunteers make this place run. They really do. Like, they do. And so, I, yeah, you get to, that's what I was going to ask you to do. You go ahead. Clap for everyone who volunteers, please. And I want to say, if you're not on a team, right, our goal for everyone here is to be in a group and on a team. If you're not on a team, if you've been kind of hanging back and you're spectating and you're part, you've been, you know, making sure that we're a place you want to be, that's awesome. But if you haven't jumped in yet, you won't grow the way that you want to grow. You know, just, just coming into receiving is a good place to start, absolutely. But to really grow in your faith, you got to step in and serve and be part of a team that's bigger than yourself, that you're pulling together to pull something off and that you're helping one another out. And so I really want to encourage you because today, like, Sunday morning wouldn't have happened without this team. And this team was able to work with one another with, with joy and grace and kindness and love because they've been working together and pulling together for such a long time. So that's my plug this morning that our volunteers really have made today happen. They do that every Sunday. But if you're not part of a team, then I would encourage you to jump into a team. You can talk to Steve. He will help you figure out what the right one is. He's our resident matchmaker for all things. So uh, with that, we're going to continue our series uh, of the wander years. And today, you know, first hour, it was really appropriate. We were, ta we're talking about struggle today. And here's the thing. I don't like to struggle. Do, do you like to struggle? No, right? I mean, I don't know anyone's like, yes, please, more struggle. You know, we don't like to see the people that we love struggle, right? That's hard. When we see someone that we love going through a hard time, whether that's emotionally, financially, physically, whatever that is, we don't love struggle. But there are some things that can only be learned through struggle. There are some, there are some lessons that only come through struggle. For one, for one, resilience, right? You don't learn resilience when everything's great, right? That's not how resilience is built, because resilience is the ability to recover from difficult circumstances and experiences. And so if everything's perfect and wonderful and going great and you're happy and everyone's happy, you're not going to get more resilient. And so we need resilience, though. It's a key skill in life to be able to overcome to learn from, to bounce back from difficult things. And I, if you've you know, been here for a while, if you've ever talked to me, you know I love neuroscience. I just love, I'm not a big science person. You know, like I zoned out in every biology class I ever had. But neuroscience, I love because the more you study the human brain, the more, I don't know how you couldn't believe in God, the more you study the human brain. And one of the things that they found about brains is that they, they develop how they're used, right? So if you want a skill, that unless you use your brain in that to develop that skill, it will not be developed. It won't just happen for you. So like if you want to learn how to make good choices, brains need to make lots and lots and lots of choices. This is why parents, we need our kids to have the freedom to make all sorts of choices, even bad choices, because one neuroscience scientist says, if anything is worth doing, it's worth doing poorly at first, right? And that's, that's part of how brains work. You have to do things bad at first to get better at them. And so we need to experience disappointment to learn how to overcome and get the skills to overcome disappointment. We need to experience uh, things falling apart in order to gain the resilience to get better. We have to, we have to experience struggle to gain the skills to work through struggle, but it's not easy. Resilience is never easily gained. And again, it's not easy to watch someone else going through the situations that need you to gain resilience. As a parent, you know, I have that instinct when I see my daughter Imogen struggling, that I'm like, I want to help. I want to, I want to like free you from that. And I could swoop in and make it so much easier. And yet I know that when I do that, I'm not actually giving her the skills that she needs. So for instance, she started middle school this year, first, first year of sixth grade. And in the first week of school, she forgot her binder. Now, anyone who has a middle schooler knows 
Your computer and your binder are everything, right? Like that's life. And so we saw it on the table and Steve and I were like, okay, how are we going to get our binder to? Or how do we drop things off at middle school? We don't know how to do this. And we're, we're making a plan. And I said, uh, just, you know, just hear me out for a second. What if we didn't, didn't bring her her binder? What, what, if, what if we just let her go through the day without her binder? We're both like, ooh, that's going to be a rough day for her and for us. That'll be a tough day. But we decided, you know what? It's better to figure out how to overcome forgetting your binder the first week of school where the stakes are real low than later. And I'm like, she will not forget her binder after this. I, I, I guarantee she won't. So she had a terrible day, like the worst day. She didn't have any of her notebooks, so she had to keep trying to find paper from people to take notes. She didn't have her science permission slip, so they were doing this really cool science experiment, and she just had, she's like, Mommy, just to watch and take notes. And she came home, and she was in a terrible mood, like the worst. And we, we had braced for it. And that night, as we were you know going to bed, I'm talking to her about it, and she's telling me how terrible her day was and like, yeah that sounds that sounds really really hard I said you know uh, j maybe would you like to hear how I I deal with forgetting things like because I'm pretty forgetful I can forget things and she's out like yes mom please please give me your wisdom that would help me not ever forget something again no she's like fine fine and I said well you know I'm you know you're tiptoeing when you're talking to a middle schooler who's in a bad mood and I'm saying well, what I do is when I get something ready, I put it right by the door. That way, I literally have to walk over it so that I can't leave without tripping over it. She's like, whatever. But I, you know, it wasn't like, oh, that's so good, Mom. That's really great sage wisdom that I will live by. No, she was not like, that's so great. She just, whatever. But I can tell you this, that kid has not forgot her binder once since then. And she puts it by the door, right? That's, but it wasn't like, yes, I receive your wisdom. She just needed to learn it on her own. And she learned it far better through a day of struggle than me reminding her every single day for all of sixth grade, did you remember your binder? Do you have your stuff? Do you have your homework? Do you have your permission slip? She won't forget it anymore. And if she does, she, she knows she can survive a day without her binder. Was that easy? No. Now, here's the truth. If there was a struggle-free life, I would sign up for that, would you? Like if you, if someone's like, here's struggle free life, there's no difficult people at all. No difficult neighbors, no difficult coworkers, no difficult family members. Uh, there's no hard choices at all. You know, there's nothing that's going to go wrong. It's going to be great. You would sign up for that. I know I would too, but here's the thing. There are gifts in struggle. There are gifts that we can only receive through struggle. And while struggle is uncomfortable and it definitely is uncomfortable, it doesn't mean that it is without meaning, right? And Barbara Brown Taylor, she talks about these seasons of struggle when we go through them as wilderness seasons, as wilderness seasons. And she says, in the wilderness, we're lost. We've lost our way. We don't know which way to go. The path isn't clear anymore. And she says, it's a gift. The wilderness is a gift because it wakes you up. It takes you off of autopilot. The, the path isn't clear any longer. The next step isn't obvious. And now you have to pay attention to your life. And she says this, something is happening to you in this wilderness that does not happen when you are safe at home. Even though you would rather not think about it, you are exquisitely vulnerable in this moment. You are vulnerable to this moment. Your carefully maintained safety net has ripped. Your expensive armor has sprung a leak. You are in need of help, and your awareness of this is not a bad thing. So she says, there are unnoticed treasures in the, in the wilderness. I love that. Unnoticed treasures. Things that you would just normally pass by and not pay attention to. But in the wilderness, suddenly you're, all you're doing is paying attention because you're trying to figure out, what do I do? Where do I go? What's the next right thing? And we live in a culture that values efficiency and quickness, right? What's the fastest line from A to B? How do I get there? And the least amount of trips with the least amount of trouble. That's, what, that's how we want to live our lives. And so wilderness seasons, they are disorienting. They are uncomfortable. They mess everything up. But if you were to go back and point out the seasons where you grew the most in your life, you would point out wilderness seasons. The seasons of struggle, are this, are, they are tied with our growth. I love this line from Barbara Brown Taylor. She says, God does some of God's best work with those who are truly and seriously lost. Let that be a comfort 
to some of you today if you are feeling truly and seriously lost. God is at work. And that's what Moses wants to remind the Israelites as they are once again on the threshold of the borderland, of the, the border of the promised land. Come right up to the border. They're right there. And God, Moses wants to remind them of all that God has done in their lives through this wilderness time. And so remember, we left the Israelites last week. They were at the threshold of the borderland, of the, I keep saying the borderland, the promised land. And uh, they were right there and they could have gone in. And what did they do? No, there's giants in there. It's really scary and it's too big. And you know what? Egypt looks really good. So let's turn around and go back. And God said, fine. You know what? I'm going to give you what you want. This generation cannot enter the promised land. They're not ready. They cannot change their mindset. And so we need a new generation. So he said, anyone 20 years old or older who has witnessed the Exodus, they can't go in. They're just never going to get there. And so they're going to wander for 40 years until that generation passes away and this new generation is ready. So that's what they've been doing. They've been wandering for 40 years and the old generation is gone and Moses has brought them back to the promised land. And here's the thing, Moses can't go in with them because even as he's led them through all of the ups and downs, mostly downs, uh, he has shown that he himself doesn't have the right mindset, the right imagination to be the leader they need in the next season. And so when we get to the book of Deuteronomy, which is that last book of the first five books of the Old Testament, it's Moses' final words to the community of Israel before they are going to enter in the promised land and he's not going with them. And you know that last words are important words. Or if you have the last thing that you can say to someone when you know you're never going to see them again, what you say matters. And so Moses, he takes this time and he reminds them, this is your journey. And he tells them all the things. Remember all the times that you rebelled and God was faithful. He goes over the covenant again. Remember, this is what it means to be the people of God. This is what you've agreed to. And then he tells them the blessings that are available to them if they follow God and the curses that will come upon them should they choose to go their own way and remain stiff-necked. But all of it can be summed up with one word. The one word that Moses wants to give the community is this, remember, remember, remember how you got here. And we see that best in Deuteronomy chapter eight. And it's a long passage. I'm going to read it to us because it's really important to hear it all. And then we'll break it down. So buckle up. These are Moses's words to Israel. He says, be careful to obey all the commands I'm giving you today. Then you will live and multiply and you will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you or your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. For all these 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out and your feet didn't blister or swell. Think about it. Just as a parent disciplines a child, the Lord your God disciplines you for your own good. So obey the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you to a good land of flowing streams and pools of water, of fountains and springs that gush out in the valleys and hills. It is a land of wheat and barley, of grapevines and fig trees and pomegranates, of olive oil and honey. It is a land where food is plentiful and nothing is lacking. It is a land where iron is as common as stone and copper is abundant in the hills. And when you have eaten your fill, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. But that is the time to be careful. Beware that in your plenty, you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey his commands, regulations, and decrees that I am giving you today. For when you have become full and prosperous and have built fine homes to live in. And when your flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Do not become proud and at that time forget the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. Do not forget that he led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its poisonous snakes and scorpions where it was so hot and dry. He gave you water from the rock. He fed, you, he fed you with manna in the wilderness, a food unknown to your ancestors. He did this 
to humble you and test you for your own good. He did all this so you would never say to yourself, I have achieved this wealth with my own strength and energy. Remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you power to be successful in order to fulfill the covenant he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. And so Moses is on the border of the promised land, and he says, the land you're about to go into, it's really good. It's really good. It has everything you could want. It is so different than how you've lived. Because remember, this generation has spent the majority of their life in the wilderness. More than half their life, more than double their life they've spent in the wilderness. And so the wilderness has been a, a dry, terrifying place with no food and no water readily available. And they're about to go into something so different. And Moses wants them to remember what has marked their journey, the gifts that they've received along the way. And he wants to warn them about the dangers that will happen if they forget. And so let's start with the marks of their journey because the marks of their wilderness journey are the same marks of our wilderness journeys. And it's these three things. He talks about the trials that they went through, the tests that God did, and the teaching. And so the trials, they're in the wilderness, right? And, and Moses talks about it. He says, it's vast and dry and hot, and there are poisonous snakes and scorpions. And here's the thing. God wasn't like, you know what? I'm going to bring them to this place. I'm going to make it extra hot. I'm going to make it hotter, and I'm going to put in more poisonous snakes. So it's just, the, it's just the terrain. It's just what comes with the territory. And so the trials are just part of being in the wilderness. And so for us, same thing. There are trials in our wilderness journeys that just happen to be there, no matter what it is. And it could be fear, anxiety, disappointment, loneliness, people saying the wrong things, people misunderstanding you, you know, just worry about what's going to be next. All of that just comes with the territory of being in the wilderness. The wilderness is rough terrain. It's rough terrain emotionally, relationally, spiritually, physically. It's just the nature of the wilderness. And so the trials come with those seasons, but he also says there were tests, that God did test them. And they weren't just tests to punish them. It wasn't tests to make, I'm going to make you miserable just because, you know, just because I think that would be fun. No. These tests, he says, they're for your good. But he let them get hungry and fed them with manna. He let them be thirsty and had water come from a rock. That's not where water comes from. All these ways that God was trying to show up and show them who he is because he wanted to test their character. He wanted to see who are you at your core? How will you behave in this moment? It's revealing to him and to them. And the tests that God puts in our life when we're in a wilderness season also reveal our character. And those tests, more often than not, are just some various form of waiting. When you're in the wilderness, it's an unanswered prayer. It's a delayed answer. It's saying no to something that could alleviate it, but you know that that's not the right thing, and it's waiting. And most of the tests show us, like, am I someone who actually will wait for God and trust that God's doing something good here? And then along that, there's teaching. There's teaching, and it's it's in order for them to know who God is. He says, Moses says, God disciplines you like a father would discipline a child. And we hear discipline and we think punish. We hear discipline, we think, oh, we need to discipline them. That's not what that word means. That word just means to teach. That's it. There's a totally different Hebrew word for punish. It's not this one. So it's not that God punished you the way that a father punishes a child. God taught you. Like when Imogen forgot her binder, I wasn't punishing her. I was like, you know what? I'm really going to make her miserable today. That sounds great. Just show her. No. Yes, I let her struggle in order to teach her, in order for her to learn. Right? And that's God, God teaches us in the same way. And he had all these tangible ways that he taught us. You know, he's all these tangible ways that he helped the Israelites know who he was. You know, remember, you wandered for 40 years and your clothes didn't wear out. That's not what happens normally. Your shoes didn't break down. You didn't get blisters. You didn't get burned. You had food that fell from heaven. You had water that came from rocks. All these ways for God to teach them who he is, what his character is like. Because God wants them to know who he is. And God uses our wilderness seasons to teach us as well. To show us what's holding us back. To show us who he is that we might know that more clearly because in the wilderness, we're on high alert for God to show up. And so Moses, he wants them to remember what their journey has been like, 
so that then they will, they will see the gifts that they've received along the way, those unnoticed treasures. They'll have eyes up and start to see the treasures that they received. And the three treasures that they received, those three gifts in this wilderness season has been humility, contentment, and trust. Humility, contentment, and trust. Humility, when you go through a dangerous, vast, dry land where there's poisonous animals, you begin to realize your scope of yourself, right? And you realize, I am not God. And I don't, I'm not all that powerful against big poisonous animals. And I can't make myself not thirsty or not hungry. And you begin to realize that you're not God. And your, your, your perspective on yourself and the power that you have to control your life and your environment becomes a little bit more in line with reality. Because humility is not a low opinion of yourself. It's not thinking, I'm the worst and I'm terrible and you know, I'm so glad that God even looks at me. Humility is a right perspective on yourself. That's all it is. It's a right perspective to say, I am not God and God is God. God is bigger than me. And so when I'm in a, in a dangerous, vast land that I can't control, God is in control. And so humility was going to be needed for the Israelites to be the people of God that he wants them to be, to go into this promised land and live differently, to know that they are dependent on God's goodness, that they are reliant on his provision. And then the next gift is contentment. And contentment is about not just, you know, having what you want, it's wanting what you have. And this is a generation, remember, that has consisted on manna and water. You know, and they haven't had a lot of variety. Some of you are like, I need a different thing for every meal. Like, I can't eat the same thing every day. Imagine eating the same thing for every meal every day for 40 years. There's no like, you know what, I think I'd like a sandwich today. It's like, there's manna. And you don't get lots and lots and lots of manna. It's like, collect enough that, for what you need today. And then connect, collect enough what you need for tomorrow. And then one day a week, connect, collect what you need for two days and because you're going to rest and you're just going to stop. And think about that. It creates this whole generation that says, this is enough. God has provided enough because the old generation, they kept looking back to Egypt and saying, oh, remember we had leeks in Egypt? Remember there were watermelons back in Egypt? Oh, there was so much variety of food back in Egypt. The only price of it is our freedom. You know, we just have to be slaves, but we can eat all sorts of things. And God has created a generation that looks to him to provide for, for what, they, what they need because they're about to go into a land that has everything. But he's creating a generation that is content. Barbara Brown Taylor says that they're going to arrive at the, the promised land and they're going to know how to say thank you and mean it. I love that. They're going to know how to say thank you and mean it. And contentment is best learned in the wilderness. Contentment is best learned through scarcity and not abundance. We think abundance is what's going to give us contentment. If I just have more, I just had more. And once I have a lot, then I'll be content. But it's actually the opposite. It's when we learn to see that God is providing with what we need right now, that I can be grateful for what I have right now. That's how contentment is built. And so contentment is a gift that the wilderness gives us. And then the last gift is trust. This idea of trusting God, because faith doesn't mean certainty. Faith means trust. And in this wilderness journey, they've had to trust God in all things. They don't know where they're going. It's this windy path that's not making any sense. They can't provide for themselves. It's not a land where you can just get your own food and get your own water. And so God has been showing them that you don't just need bread. You need me. People don't subsist just on your physical needs, but every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, that, that is what's going to help you thrive. And God doesn't want them to just go into the promised land and mindlessly obey. Say, well, you better follow my rules or else I'm going to get mad and kick you out. That's not the relationship that God is looking for. God wants a community that trusts him enough to follow his decrees and his commands and his regulations because they trust his goodness. They trust his character the whole time. If we go all the way back to week one of this series, remember God's heart has always been, I want to be your God and I want you to be my people. I want a relationship with you. I want you to trust me. That's what faith is. And you know what? Trust, again, is best built in the wilderness because trust is best built when there's a degree of uncertainty. When, you know, if you know everything's going to exactly land this way, it's all scripted out and there's no uncertainty, that's not trust. Trust is, it could go this way. You could hurt me. You could do something that wouldn't benefit me, but I trust that you won't. I trust that you're going to do what's best for me and what's best for us. That's trust. 
And so trust is built in the wilderness because we can't be guaranteed of the outcome. And these are the gifts. And I know in wilderness seasons in my own life, you know, when I look back, again, I can see the trials, the tests, the teaching, and the gifts that come from it. You know, I had a season where I was unemployed and I was looking, looking for a job and didn't know what was going to be next. And, you know, the, the reality is when you're unemployed, the trials just come with the territory, right? Suddenly, every dollar you spend is getting closer to zero. And you're worried and you're anxious and you've got all sorts of people who give you terrible advice. Like, well, maybe you should just, or did you pray this? And you're like, thank you for that. Not great. You know, and you've got, you feel misunderstood. You feel alone. You feel abandoned. That's just part of the territory. It's just rough terrain. But there was a lot of tests in that because there were plenty of jobs that came my way that I could have jumped at and been like, that, that'll make me feel better. But I knew they were the wrong job. I knew they were the wrong thing to say yes to. And so this, this, this test of will you wait? Will you wait and trust that I have the right thing for you. And one of the best teaching moments came when Steve and I were visiting with our best friends and I was talking about all the angst and worry I had and the sadness and how I felt abandoned. And my friend, he turned to me and he goes, well, you know, you know that God could give you the perfect job tomorrow, right? God, God could have someone call you tomorrow and say, hey, I don't even know you. Here's the perfect job. He had done that to me in the past. Like people called me out of the blue and was like, I want to hire you. And it was weird, right? And so he's like, that could happen. So Right now in your life, it's kind of like being stuck in traffic. And you can't control whether you're stuck in traffic. You can't control whether the accident gets cleared up or people you know, stop gawking at whatever, or they go faster. You can't control that. You can only control how you're stuck in traffic. Right? You can be stuck in traffic and get yourself all worked up and get angry and start snapping at the people in the car with you and be irritated and just think this is the worst and dwell on everything terrible. Or you could think, well, I'm here in the car with people that I love. I got some good music, and maybe we got time on our hands to have a conversation. You choose. And that was so helpful for me to be like, oh, do I trust God enough to not work myself up with something that I can't fix, that is bigger than me? I can do what I can do, and I have to wait on the Lord. And these are the gifts that are available, available to us in the wilderness. You know, they're best built in the wilderness. But Moses, he wants to remind them of this, but he also wants to make clear, he wants to warn them of the dangers should they forget. Should they forget the journey that it took to get here and all the things that God did and shaped them for in this moment. And so he, he says, you're about to go in this really good land. It's so good. It's so much better than the wilderness. But beware, because you will forget God. And if you forget God, these are the things that could set in. Pride, entitlement, and self-reliance. And pride Moses says, you're about to go into a land that's not dangerous at all. He doesn't mention like, you know, there's all these fig trees and pomegranates and there's bigger snakes. You know, there's even bigger snakes. Oh, it's like, this land is so good. It's so wonderful. He talks about all the good, good things in it. That you're going to have plenty of food and plenty to drink and you're going you're gonna to get there. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to build wonderful homes. These are people who have lived in tents for over 40 years. They've just wandered around tents. Right? That's what they've done. They haven't had a home. He says, you're going to have a home. And your herds and your flocks, they're going to grow and multiply. And your silver and gold, it's going to increase. And it's going to be great. You're going to have plenty. And once you have plenty, be sure to praise God. Be sure to stop and thank God. Because you know what's going to happen? You're going to get plenty. And you're going to start to think that, I, I'm good. I'm good. You know what? My ways are pretty good. My thoughts are pretty good. My priorities are pretty good. And you start to put yourself in the place of God. Thanks, God, for bringing me here. I got it from here. You know, and he even warns, Moses warns them right after this passage in Deuteronomy 8. In Deuteronomy 9, he says, oh, you're about to go into this land. And be sure you don't start saying to yourselves, we got this land because we're so righteous, because we're so good. Isn't that so great? He says, no, it's not because of your righteousness, because they were so wicked, they forfeited it. It has nothing to do with your righteousness. But he's warning them, you're going to go in there and think, we're pretty good. You know, God, God must really like us. Look at all that I've done. I can trust myself and my ways. And we stop turning to God. We stop praising God and we stop seeing God as our provider. And we start seeing ourselves as our provider. And so pride is at the root of all sin because pride is me putting myself in God's place. Saying, I, I make a pretty good God and I'm a pretty good boss of my life. And once we get into pride, we are quick to entitlement. Because entitlement is, I deserve this. It says, you're going to get there and everything's going to grow. And you're going to have so much. You're going to have so much plenty and abundance. It's going to be wonderful. And you're going to start to think, yep, 
this, this, is, this is about right. This is my standard of living, and I deserve this, and I might even deserve more than this. You know, and he says, remember, remember, manna from the sky, water from the rock. Remember what it was to be content, to trust that God had given you exactly what you needed. Because you're going to get there, and you're going to have so much, and you're going to start to think, yeah, this, this, I deserve this all along. And when we get entitled, it, it's two sides of the same coin. One side is selfish expectation. I deserve what I want. You know, if I don't have it, that, that's a problem. I, I deserve whatever standard I set for myself. And we start to get greedy, and we start to hoard our stuff and think, this is all mine. It's my house and my car and my family and my money and my retirement account. It's all mine. And I deserve every single penny of it. Or on the other side, if we don't get what we want, we go into self, self-centered victimhood. Like Life is robbing me. I deserve to have all of these things and I don't have them. And so now I'm, I'm just focused on what I don't have and how something or someone has taken what I deserve. And so we start to tally up what, what we are owed and what we don't have when we get more resentful and we get more bitter and we get more and more and more self-absorbed and more and more self-centered. That's what entitlement does to us. And this is why God tells them over and over and over and over again, remember that you were slaves in Egypt. Remember where you came from. You had nothing. Remember, you were strangers in a strange land. So when you come into this land, you are to welcome the stranger. You are to go above and beyond to be a a community that is uh, welcoming and kind and generous because God was so generous with you. But when we forget when we forget, we start to think, I, I deserve what I have, and I might even deserve more, because we get some and we want more. And, that's, and then once we get into entitlement, it's so easy to, to then fall into self-reliance. You know, and, and God says, oh, it's going to go so well for you. It's going to be so great. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to get to this point where you have everything in the promised land, and you're going to think, yep, I did pretty good pretty good. My strength and my energy made all of this happen. I'm pretty awesome. Like, I got in here and look at all the hard work that I did to make this happen for me. And Moses says, hey, I want you to remember the fact that you can even work, the fact that you can be successful at all, that's all a gift from God. None of it is anything you gave yourself. It's all a gift, but you're going to forget that. You're going to forget that and you're going to start to think, oh, this is all for me and because of me. Because the point of going into the promised land is to fulfill the covenant. And the covenant is for Israel to go first, to set up a new society, to draw everyone to that type of society, to to show what God wants for every nation. He says, oh, no, you're going to start to think, I did this. I'm pretty good. Like, look at all I earned for myself. And, And then you can do with it what you want. And the truth is, we have all fallen into these because the promised land, it breeds forgetfulness. It breeds forgetfulness. We're so quick to forget when we get into the promised land. When we're in the wilderness, we're desperate for God. And we know our desperation for God. We know our need, and that's not a bad thing. We get into the promised land, and we forget. And so quickly, pride sets in when suddenly we have abundance, and things feel good, and it feels like there's enough or even more than enough. And we think, ah, you know, I, God, God's okay, and I might, I might thank God every once in a while, but really, like, I'm going to live my life the way I want to live my life. I'm going to set my own standards. I know best. I know best for me. And then we quickly go to entitlement. You know, I, I deserve all of this. I worked hard for it, and it's mine. It's my money, my house, my bank account, my family, my car. All of it's mine, and I get to choose. And maybe once in a while, I might ask God if he wants to borrow it. You know, do you want to borrow some of my money, God? It's really all mine, so maybe I'll give you a little bit. But, you know, good for me if I do. It's so quick to start to think, it's all mine. And then self-reliance, because how many of us, myself included, we pray for financial provision. We ask God to meet our financial needs, right? And we say, God, please bless this or increase my finances. And God does. And do you ever stop and say, God, what would you like me to do with this money? How would you like me to use this money that you so generously provided for me? No, we're so quick to be like, thanks, God. Got it from here. It's all mine. And I'll choose how to use it. And maybe if I feel generous, I'll give you some. But you know, it's really mine because I, I earned it by my own energy and my own strength. We're so quick to forget the fact that you woke up today in the land of the living, that you have breath in your lungs as a gift from God, that every day is a gift from God, 
that every dollar you have in your bank account is a gift from God, that everything you own is a gift from God. None of it do you deserve or did you earn on your own. It's all a gift. But we're so quick to think it's mine and I get to choose. I'm the decider. And that comes back to pride. The promised land breeds forgetfulness over and over and over again. And Moses, he wants to warn them, if you get the promised land and you forget God, you lose it all. You miss the whole point. If you forget God, it's not worth it. He says this to them at the end of Deuteronomy 8, but I assure you of this, if you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods, worshiping and bowing down to them, you will certainly be destroyed. Just as the Lord has destroyed other nations in your path, you also will be destroyed if you refuse to obey the Lord your God. To forget God is to choose the path of destruction. It is to look like everybody else. And God, the whole point of the promised land is to come in and set up a new society, to be different, to look different, to draw people to something that is totally different. He says, if you choose to go this way instead of this way, you're choosing to walk away from God. You're choosing to live apart from from God. You will forfeit the land just like the wicked people before you did. Because you can do that. You can forfeit it all. You can gain it all and lose it all. And Jesus, as he's building the new people of God, as he's saying, I want to be your God and you be my people, he gives us the same warning. And he says this, then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? The promised land without God is a loss. The whole world without God is a loss. Jesus is saying you can get all the blessings that you want, all the blessings of the, all the things, and I want them too. Like, I'm not up here going, don't pray, don't pray for God to provide for you. Like, we do pray for provision, but you can get all the provision and all the blessings and all the gifts, and if you forget God, it's all a loss. You forfeit your own soul. Jesus says, what's worth more than that? What is worth more than your soul? Your soul is the only eternal thing about you. It's not some ghosty part of yourself. The soul, when it comes to scripture, is the core of who you are the core of your life, the core of your character. And the scriptures talk about your soul being on loan to you. It is on loan to you. And one day God will call that loan due and he wants to see what you've done with it. It's the only thing that matters. And so if you gain all the gifts of the world and forget the giver, you lose it all. But Jesus does not call us to a struggle-free life. I mean, that's not a great picture right there. He's like, give up your own way. Don't be your own God. Let go of pride. Let go of entitlement because you got to pick up your cross, right? And that's, that's an image of going and sacrificing and dying, you know, so that you might follow me and find life. You can't rely on yourself. You find life through Jesus, not through your own strength and energy. That's just how it goes. He's calling us to remember that. And so Moses, at the, at the border of the promised land, he turns to Israel and he says, remember Remember where you came from. Remember what you left behind. Remember who brought you here. And remember why. God brought you here not just for you to build big houses and have bigger flocks and have lots of silver and gold. God brought you here to start something new, to start a new kingdom, a whole new people that will be a light to the whole world. And we are called to remember this is why you see Jesus as the new Moses over and over in Scripture. If you go through and read the New Testament, you read the book of Hebrews, you read the Gospel of Matthew, you're going to see Jesus in that place of Moses. You'll see the parallels of these stories. And God is calling us to a kingdom, a, a much better kingdom than what Israel was going to establish. This is how the author of Hebrews talks about the kingdom of God that we are waiting for. He say, since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. See, the Israelites, they received a kingdom that could be taken from them, and eventually it was, right? Because it was all dependent on their obedience and their faithfulness, whether they chose to follow God. And you know what? They stayed stiff-necked, and they continued to go their own way, and they continued to worship other gods, and they continued to break covenant over and over and over again until finally they were driven from the land just like God promised. They chose the path of destruction over and over and over again. 
But Hebrews, that word unshakable means it can't be moved. There's no chaos possible with it. it. It can't be thrown into disorder. It's steady. It is unshakable. And you know why it is unshakable? Because it is not dependent on our faithfulness and our obedience. It is dependent on Jesus' faithfulness and Jesus' obedience. This is why Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days at the beginning of his ministry, because it parallels Israel's journey. And where Israel failed, Jesus was faithful. Where humans couldn't do it, Jesus comes along. God himself comes along as one of us and does it for us. And he is the one who is faithful. And so the kingdom is unshakable because it's his kingdom. And unlike Moses, who could only bring Israel up to the border and couldn't go with them, Jesus leads the way forward. We follow behind Jesus into this kingdom. And that brings us to our memory verse for this series, the verse that we've been reflecting on, which is this. Now you are no longer slaves. You are not slaves to the law, to the rules. You're not slaves to sin, to death any longer, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. And what does it mean to be an heir? It means that you're going to inherit what God wants to give us, which is this unshakable kingdom. That's our promise. That's the promised land that we are called to long for and hope for and that we are always on the the threshold of and that God is preparing us for to inherit that kingdom, that kingdom that is set on justice and love and goodness that can't be shaken because Jesus is the one who establishes it. And so with this inheritance, as we await this unshakable kingdom as children of God, as fully beloved, as fully accepted, we are called like the Israelites to live differently, to live as people who are primarily citizens of that kingdom, who allow justice and love and God's goodness and God's ways and God's decrees and God's regulations to guide our life, not out of fear, but out of trust, out of humility, We learn to be content because we know this world and the things of this world, that's not the ultimate promise. This is not our home. We're just passing through. And we're waiting for a much better kingdom, one that cannot be taken from us ever. Nothing can shake it. And so we're called to remember. And we've been doing this as our practice through this series of taking communion at the end because communion is our practice of remembering. And so I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward and start to hand out communion. If you need gluten-free, they're in the baskets on the back tables by the doors. And as, as we're receiving the elements right now, I just want you to take a moment and think about where you are in your journey. Are you in a wilderness season of your journey? Are you in a place where you feel a little bit lost and you feel a little bit disoriented and the path isn't clear anymore? and you're wondering what you're supposed to do or who you're supposed to be, good news, God does some of God's best work with people who are truly and sincerely lost. And there are gifts for you in that wilderness season. And maybe you're in a place where you need to ask God for those gifts, to be on the lookout for those gifts of humility, of contentment, of trust, and seeing how God is providing and what God is teaching you and what's holding you back and who God is in this moment. Or maybe you're in a promised land moment in your life and things are good and you forgot. You forgot. You forgot who brought you there. You forgot whose it is and who you live for. And you started to think, I did this by myself. And maybe we need that reminder because we see pride and entitlement and self-reliance creeping in. And all of those pull us away from God and what God has for us. Wherever you are, know that God meets us in that. Because the kingdom that we're inheriting is unshakable. Whether you forget or not, Jesus can't forget. And so therefore we remember that on the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Whenever you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Take and eat, remembering the gift of what Jesus has given us, the gift of freedom, that he walked through the the ultimate struggle to set us free. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup of wine, and after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, 
which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Take and drink and remember the freedom that has been won for us. Remember that God is so worthy of trust and love and obedience, not because we're afraid, but because why would we not? Look at what he's done to set us free. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for who you are in the wilderness. We thank you who you are in the promised land, that you are faithful, that the kingdom that we await is unshakable because it's grounded in you, in your character, in your faithfulness, Jesus. And so God, if there's ways in our lives that we've forgotten, that we've taken our eyes off of you, in the wilderness we've allowed the trials and the testing to overcome us, or in the promised land we've begun to rely on ourselves, would you help us recenter ourselves on you, Jesus? Help us to receive all the gifts that you have for us, to grow us into the people that you are calling us to be, a people that's faithful, a people that are a light to all those around us who call us to the freedom and the goodness and the love that you want for all people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.